Good morning, my lovely students. Today is two days after Valentine's Day. It's one day after President's Day. And then we were hit with an ice slash snowstorm that caused a cancellation of school. And I thought with the AP exam coming out in about, well, 80 days, it would be romantic of us to spend some time talking about, yes, AP European history. Now seriously, remember, please don't hate me. We have to cover a certain amount of material so that we can have adequate time to review before the AP exam and the final. After that, it's smooth sailing, I promise. So don't ignite your inner romantic and unleash a revolt against me. I'm actually doing this for you. How romantic is that? So today I'm going to ask you guys to do a few things. Uh, number one, uh, go to Google Classroom and you're going to need to download um, the document that says Romanticism Activity Student. And obviously uh, it looks something like this. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is read uh, Activity 1 and the concept from the AP Curriculum Framework as such. Okay, read that. And then there are two questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the two questions um, relate to the material, to the content, and it's kind of a synthesis activity. What factors of tension in the above excerpt have we covered this year so far? Uh, so a lot of that stuff will be in the preceding chapters to chapter 21. And what factors have we yet to cover, but will shortly? And again, some of this material here with Darwin, Einstein, obviously that's stuff uh, that's important but we haven't covered yet. So just make a quick list, uh, use this as kind of a warm-up activity, and it should take you about, you know, probably less than five minutes. But see how many you can uh, write down. And again, I'm going to check this in class tomorrow. Now that you've done activity one, let's look at activity two, which involves the thematic learning objectives from this particular unit. And um, what I want you to do is kind of go through here and make a list I don't really need you to write uh, major things out in sentence form, but make a list um, uh, of material that you've learned in this chapter that relates to the content of this lesson, uh, along with previous lessons. Linking those, again, is a big part of the historical thinking skills. And if you look at uh, the first theme, which is uh, PP, Politics and Power, explain how industrialization elicited to critiques from artists, socialists, and workers' movements, and feminist organizations. So, after you've paused this and have added a few things, uh, we can talk about a few things as well. First of all, it's not politics and power, it's poverty and prosperity, or prosperity and poverty. And so, as we go through this, you know, one of the things that we've just learned about in chapter 20 was the Industrial Revolution and how industrialization changed a lot of things and, and, and this will be covered in some of the themes but industrialization and society disgusted people and that was one of the big themes of the romantics um, in their mind you know the enlightenment had more or less created uh, a lot of the uh, economic with with it laissez-faire the economic situations of, of prosperity for maybe the upper middle class the bourgeoisie if we talked about but it also had created a new class of poor uh, totally changed the way that they lived and, you know, um, did away with any semblance of independence. You know, we've talked about the enclosure movement. There's no more cottage system. Um, they're, they're basically um, in a situation where they have no control over their prosperity and no control over their future, and they're just products of this Industrial Revolution. And for the Romantics, it's just a tragic event. And uh, the fact that these people have no hope in their minds uh, is one of the big themes um, that that they capitalize on, you know, they they talk about how the Enlightenment and this age of reason that you could solve everything had created a unimaginative uh, situation. You know, um, the Enlightenment. Uh, one of the themes in the Enlightenment, even going back to the Renaissance, was that the Middle Ages uh, was a joke. That it was uh, a time where people were ridiculously ignorant. However, in the Romantic era, you know, they kind of go back. We'll talk about this with Sir Walter Scott, but they they put an emphasis and, and almost a nostalgic approach to uh, chivalry and you know they talk about the Middle Ages and how you know even though the peasants were peasants they still had kind of um, uh, an, an independent virtue uh, where they were able to farm at least for themselves and and that all of that stuff 
basically was, as a result of the industrialization of Europe, uh, gone by the wayside. So, you know, you'll see that in the crit critiques of artists. Uh, we've learned about socialist Flora Triste and Louis Blanc in, you know, workers' movements, whether it's the Chartist movement in England, um, but also we see uh, labor unions, guilds, uh, trying to cling to their existence in places like France and, and really all over Europe. Um, and again, Flora Triestin can be thrown in there with feminist organizations. So there's some stuff that you can write down uh, in there. Now the next one uh, that I kind of want to pay attention to, uh, for you to pay attention to, is OS 10. And OS 10 is really about objective and subjective visions. Uh, and so in this, this is a really uh, looking at the characteristics, if you will, of the Romantic era. Individualism, subjectivity, emotion, and I'm not talking very loud, so if you're wondering why I'm being so quiet, um, I have two uh, out of my three children are pretty sick, fevers, throwing up, all that stuff, and uh, they're still sleeping. So I'm trying not to wake them up. You know, so again, getting into this key concept 3.61, Romanticism um, broke with the neoclassical forms of artistic representation. Uh, and again, you associate neoclassical with the Enlightenment. And it was basically, um, well, you think about the classical art of the Renaissance. You know, a lot of the neoclassical uh, styles, whether it be architecture, we see a resurgence in pillars arches and um, domes and things of that nature like in Washington DC that's a great case uh, of or example of neoclassical architecture but like a lot of Jacques Louis David's painting and you think about the the death of Horatio and um, or uh, the death of Socrates or um, the oath of Horatio that's what I meant to say and you know uh, in it are themes from ancient Greece or ancient Rome and you know, in it you see a resurgence of pillars and um, symmetry and things of that nature. So what we're seeing here with the Romantic, it's distinctly different. And so let's talk about these uh, characteristics. Look, it's emotion over reason. Like I said, um, they, they really focused on human senses, passion and faith, those types of emotions and were qualities that Romantics... Um, you know, they, they, they put a premium on them. Um, you know, reason, as I said, they were disgusted with the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason and what it created with the Industrial Revolution. Um, they glorified nature. You're going to see a lot of landscapes. They emphasized its beauty and uh, tempestuousness, uh, which is a word that I never use, but uh, I put it in there just for you guys. Um, they, re it, again, rejected the Enlightenment view of nature as a precise harmonious whole and rejected deism. So what we're going to see is a, a, a resurgence of re religious revivals. We're going to see um, a resurgence in Catholicism in some states uh, and then a wave of new new type of, uh, if you read, Protestantism with the uh, Great Awakening and um, Methodism and that whole movement, fire and brimstone speeches. So uh, make sure you guys check that out at the end of chapter um, 21. Um, and again, they also ejected, rejected the Enlightenment view of the past, which was counter-progressive to human history. They actually put a premium uh, on history. We're going to start looking at a dialectical approach to history. And really, one of the things uh, that they love about history and what romantics um, glorify is kind of the concept of her heroism, uh, that there are heroes, great men that drive change in the forces of good in history. And that's going to be a romantic theme. They encourage personal freedom. Uh, these are kind of like uh, early hippies. They grew long, long beards. They didn't care about their personal dress. Um, so you have this reflection uh, in in society and how these people are trying to um, separate themselves from, um, you know, basically by expressing themselves like hippies uh, in the 70s and the 60s. Uh, they're going to dress differently. They're going to write differently. They're going to try to portray themselves as different uh, than the norm. And again, by emphasizing feeling, humanitarian movements were created to fight slavery. Uh, we're going to start to see the um, uh, a lot of the, the free nations of the world, Western civilization, start gradually one by one uh, 
getting rid of slavery once and for all. Um, some of these people wanted to go against poverty, so we'll talk about socialism, communism, uh, and again, the overall industrial evils that had been created uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. In some cases, it drew upon ideals, as I've already talked about, Middle Ages, honor, faith, chivalry, um, and, and we'll see those in uh, novels like Sir Walter Scott. And then I just want to make a, a real quick notation here that in Central and Eastern Europe, the Romantics focused on peasant life and transcribed folk songs, tales, and proverbs. And we're going to see in some of these countries, the Romantics fo focus on, uh, you know, just rampant nationalism. Um, who are the people that, that kind of are the forerunners? You know, we talked about the Enlightenment. Well, we could kind of talk about Jean-Jacques Rousseau as one of the important forerunners of Romanticism with his social contract and believing that society and materialism had corrupted human nature and then something was wrong. Uh, if you remember back to that, we talked about uh, he and others believed that man was a noble savage uh, in a state of nature. Um, also, Immanuel Kant, who kind of coined the phrase, dare to know, um, he accepted the rationalism of the Enlightenment, but he also uh, really believed in preserving human freedom, immorality, and the existence of God. And he helped establish philosophy as a separate branch from religion, uh, but wasn't ready to give up on God. Uh, and again, religion, as we said, is still important to romantics. Um, no doubt that the Romantic movement was largely inspired, and we've already talked about this, but inspired by the French Revolution, liberalism, and nationalism that was unleashed during the French Revolution and the following Napoleonic era. Uh, really, really uh, impacted the Romantic movement. There's another movement that we'll learn about a little bit later called Sturm und Drang, uh, which means storm and stress in German, but it was used by German Romantics in the 1770s and 1780s, and it conveyed emotional intensity. And we'll see that in German music, but we'll also see it in German art. And then uh, another guy that's going to influence uh, Marx is George William Friedrich uh, Hegel. And um, really a leading figure of German idealism, uh, the dialectic approach. Initial thesis is challenged by an opposing view and an anti antithesis. Listen, we'll go over this in chapter um, 22. So if you're not really ready for this, that's fine. But I just want to kind of introduce it to you now. Um, and Johann Fichte, um, in his German a a nation, addressed to the German nation, uh, developed romantic nationalism that saw Germans as being superior over others. and uh, you know, even though he was strongly anti-Semitic, uh, we know that Germany is going to be alive and well and very influential in the Romantic movement, uh, as they also were uh, key contributors to the ideas of liberalism and nationalism that rocked Europe in the 19th century. So let's talk about Romantic artists and composers. And, and as we do this, you can kind of go down the list and start taking notes on some of these artists, composers, and um, writers. But uh, 361A says that romantic artists and composers broke from classical artistic forms to emphasize emotion, nature, individuality, and intuition, the supernatural and the natural, national histories in their works. All right, so let's go to first, Francisco Goya. Now, Francisco Goya was a court painter for the Spanish crown, and he painted numerous works uh, of the Peninsular War, of the Napoleonic Wars. And the most famous uh, that we're going to look at was the 3rd of May, 1814, uh, actually 1808, but um, typo, where he shows Spanish revolutionaries being executed by a French firing squad. This can also be found in your textbook uh, on page 603. So if you kind of look at this painting, after imposing his brother uh, Joseph on the throne of Spain, Napoleon caused the Spanish people to revolt against his authority. Now again, even though this is still in the Napoleonic era, this is nationalism, and this is why this is basically a, a great example of romantic uh, painting. It's a series of riots uh, broke out in Madrid. This painting demonstrates that the French response to those riots it was a deliberate execution of Spanish citizens to scare the French people, or I'm sorry, the Spanish people. So it demonstrates the French response to these uh, riotous outbreaks. And it was a deliberate execution of Spanish citizens to scare the people into obedience and submission to the French troops. And Goya portrays the French troops as ultimately a firing squad, killing people, including, if you look in there, including a monk, which is a no-no. Um, it, it's essentially a reign of terror, but it's a reign of terror in Spain. Uh, the peasant in the middle, uh, as you can see, he highlights him, throws out his arms in a gesture which is reminiscent of a crucifixion of Christ. 
and Goya painted many scenes depicting the horrors of the Napoleonic Spain. It's not neoclassical. Why? Well, first of all, you don't have any pillars. You don't have any uh, arches. You don't have any domes. Uh, you don't have any, you know, German or uh, Greek heroic figures. Um, if anything, you know, one of the things that this kind of reminds me of is in Spain, mannerism. And if you remember uh, El Greco, the Greek, uh, did so in a style like uh, in his paintings, um, let's see, remembering back, the burial of Count of Vorgaz or a uh, view of Toledo. If you remember mannerism, uh, it was like uh, what it would be like to look at a painting in flickering light. And that was the, the style that uh, was created there. And if you look at this painting, it kind of has that and resembles uh, the El Greco techniques there. But anyway, very nationalistic, obviously. Next we have Caspar David Friedrich. Uh, who had a lifelong preoccupation with God and nature. He was known for his landscapes with an interest in, uh, that basically transcended the mere presentation of natural details. It was very deep. Um, in his paintings, a lot of times you can, you can sense a feeling of mystery and mysticism. If you remember mysticism, go back to chapter 12. Um, it's kind of a precursor to the, the Reformation and people's philosophy of God and nature. And um, so, again, it, it, resembling some of these things, some of these um, artistic movements of the Romantic period actually tap into some of the other art movements that we've learned about earlier in the year. Um, again, arts and reflection of society and a lot of things in society and just like styles and fashion and clothing repeat themselves. But <clears throat> anyway, he believed that nature was a manifestation of divine life. So again, mysticism. Um, and this one, it, this is titled Man and Woman Gazing at the Moon. And it really does. It does everything that we just talked about. It expresses the mystical view of nature that the divine is everywhere. And you have two solitary wanderers uh, that are shown from the back gazing at the moon. And you can tell in this painting that they're overwhelmed by the all-pervasive presence of nature. And the two figures express the human longing for infinity. The next one we're going to look at is the wander above the sea of Friedrich is quoted by saying that divine is everywhere, even in a grain of sand. In this painting, a solitary wanderer is shown from the back, gazing at the mountains covered in fog. Um, overwhelmed by the all-pervasive presence of what nature is, the figure expresses the human longing for infinity. Ask yourself, what is infinity in this context? Is it religious? Is it knowledge? Is it everything? Yes, it's everything. Um, and again, uh, a sense that there is something more powerful uh, than human human beings and, and human reason uh, is, again, one of those themes that resonates with romantics that uh, conflicts with, if you think about it, the ideals of the Enlightenment. Next, we have J.M. W. Turner, um, who began to paint in a fashion where he sought to create an atmosphere through the skillful use of light and color. And in this painting, which is titled Rain, Steam, and Speed, Turner eliminates specific details and uses the general fields of color to convey an impression of locomotive rushing toward the viewer. And again, the key word is impression. Um, you know, he is known for uh, his landscapes and seascapes and sunrises and sunsets, but he attempted to convey the moods by his use of light and color to suggest natural effects. Now, I know that sounds pretty deep, but if you really look at this painting, you can see, you know, a bridge over here. And again, it's supposed to be the Great Western Railway, um, the uh, locomotive speeding towards the viewer. Um, really, what this reminds me of is Impressionism. And if you look this up, he was kind of classified as an early Impressionist. Again, if you don't know what Impressionism is, we will learn that, uh, which was a movement in the late 19th century. Um, and again, prominent movement at that with the likes of uh, Monet and Van Gogh. Next up, Eugene Delacroix. All right, uh, most famous of the French Romantic painters. And uh, as you can see on this slide, interested in the exotic and dramatic use of color. I'm going to show you some examples here uh, shortly. Probably the most famous uh, work that he is uh, renowned for is Liberty Leading the People, uh, which portrays the 1830 revolutions in France. And here we have this most influential, most recognizable of Delacroix's uh, paintings. And uh, again, commemorating the July Revolution of 1830, which removed Charles X of France from power, uh, Delacroix uh, wrote in a letter to his brother that a bad mood 
that was kind of taking a hold of him was lifting due to the painting on which he was embarking. Uh, again, this painting here, the Liberty painting. And um, if he couldn't fight for his country, then at least he would paint for it. And you can kind of sense the, uh, the, the romantic spirit of this. Um, again, the French government bought the painting in 1831 and had plans to hang it in the room of new King Louis Philippe. But it was soon taken down for its revolutionary content. If you remember, Louis Philippe, um, in a way, turned um, a little bit more conservative um, than a lot of people had intended, and that's why in 1848 he will be um, taken out of office. All right, um, Lady Liberty, which was the theme of this painting, was eventually the model for the Statue of Liberty in the United States 50 years later, and has also been featured on French banknotes. Another one of Delacroix's uh, famous paintings is The Death of Sardanapalus. And uh, it's based on Lord Byron's verse of the dramatic last moments uh, of the decadent Assyrian king, um, Sardanapalus. He was besieged by the enemy troops with little hope of survival. And Sardanapalus orders that his harem of women and prized horses go to their death with him. Nobody's going to have him. If he can't have him, nobody's going to have him. And um, at the right, you can see a guard stabbing one of the women as uh, here's the king. The king looks on. This lady's already dead. Here's the horses. He's got slaves. Um, you got some other creepy stuff going on up here. Um, but as you can see, you can see the emotion. You can see the action in this painting. And um, again, very, very resembling of uh, the romantics and their styles. Composers are uh, another one of these um, topics here that you might, you know, need to remember just in case this happens to be, as we said, this is a pretty popular um, theme on the AP exam. And we know that romantic music places a strong connection with emotion, just like the painting, um, as well as nationalism, which is conveyed through the use of national folk songs. Um, composers that you need to know, there's a, there's a handful, but we're really going to only cover or focus on two. And the first one is Ludwig von, uh, von Beethoven. And, you know, uh, Beethoven was impacted by the events of the French Revolution and Napoleon. Um, he was also in Vienna, uh, influenced by Haydn. And the thing that we need to associate with him is his symphony, which was composed in 1804. Now, the Third Symphony was originally intended for Napoleon, and he used uncontrolled rhythms to create dramatic struggle and uplifting resolutions. And he opens the floodgates of fear, of terror, of horror, and pain, and arouses that longing for the eternal, which is the essence of Romanticism. This was a quote from E.T.A. E. Hoffman, a fellow composer all right now again um, he epitomizes the genius who was not constrained by patronage as virtually all of his predecessors was he just wrote what came to him and many of his later works were written when he was actually deaf which is amazing um, he's the first composer to also incorporate vocal music in a symphony by using the text to one of Schiller's poems ode to joy in the last movement of his ninth symphony Followed. Following Beethoven was Frenchman Hector Berlioz, and he was famous in Germany, he was famous in Russia, he was famous in Britain, but not so much in France. And what he's renowned for is something called program music, which again, romantically, he used moods and sound. Uh, sound effects of instrumental music to depict the actions and emotions inherent in a story, an event, or even a personal experience. 
So this was epitomized in what you're hearing now, the Symphony Fantastique, and it was directed, directing the attention of the listener to a literary or pictorial association. Uh, it's kind of what we see in movies um, today, you know, with um, the music kind of dictating the mood that we're feeling when we're watching a movie or a story. And Berlioz uh, provided a storyline and program for the Symphony Fantis Fantis I can't even say it. Fantastic uh, to describe the life of a young artist as depicted uh, in the composition for which he wrote the piece. As you can see by my depending on the notes, I'm not uh, very in tune, if you will, with uh, with a lot of the composers. However, um, again, take a step back. What are the overall, uh, you know, attributes here that we probably need to associate with them? Well, again. It's, it's mood, it's feeling, it's emotion, and those are all qualities uh, that we associate with the romantic movement. Uh, moving right along, and ladies and gentlemen, we're almost done as you're taking notes on that piece of paper. We have romantic architecture, which, you know, we talked about, uh, we're talking about some writers here, but we said one of the ideals is kind of going back and idealizing uh, the Middle Ages. So uh, in some of these cases, uh, we see this uh, prevalent in romantic architecture and you see a gothic revival uh, returning in some notable cases and probably the most famous is the British Houses of Parliament which was rebuilt in the mid 1800s uh, after the result of a fire that burned them down so again they were completed in 1880 uh, and here you see Big Ben but these are gothic styles you see uh, churches uh, built in the late 1800s, early 1900s that are built from this style, and you've seen some even uh, by school where we are. So um, as we move on, we want to talk about romantic writers, and this is 3.61b, uh, and again, similar themes as the artists and the uh, composers, uh, and again, what are they expressing? They're expressing their discontent, really responding to the Industrial Revolution and a lot of the various political revolutions that were prevalent. Uh, during this particular day. So romantic poetry, uh, one of the things that we need to associate here, um, as we say, the romantics really love poetry. They believe that that was the supreme over all other literary forms because it was a way for people to express their souls. A lot of the stories, novels, poems um, had plots revolving young maidens tragically carried off in an early age by disease, tuberculosis, sorrow, and despair uh, of their male lovers. Um, you know, and, you know, that's really what we're talking about here. It's, it's somewhat depressing, um, but again, these people, it's a reflection of their feelings of the Industrial Revolution and the, some of the failed revolutions that we learned about earlier uh, in this particular chapter. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And, you know, he's known for a couple different ones. I'd like you to know Sorrows of Young Werther, uh, which was in 1774 and the sorrows of the young Werther personify the romantic hero uh, who has misunderstood uh, who, who has been misunderstood and rejected by society and stayed true to his or her inner feelings in this case it was a him and uh, in the in the story he's rejected by a girl whom he loved uh, and it resulted in him killing himself so suicide so this novel influenced many others during the era with tragic stories of love lost love and lovers um, the next one uh, is Faust, and it was a tragic drama, and Faust sells his soul to the devil in return for the acquisition of all knowledge. Um, it demonstrates romantic criticism of the Enlightenment's rationality and empiricism, the fact that he wanted to know all things. And, um, you know, it, again, Goethe is perhaps the greatest German romantic author of the time frame, so you need to know a couple things here. Uh, one that I'm not really mentioning too much uh, that you may have heard of is Victor Hugo, who was a French author. He uh, wrote Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, and also Les Miserables, which is also known as Les Mis, which was made into a musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, now, again, romanticism in his novels was evidenced with his use of fantastic characters, strange settings, and obviously powerful powerful human emotions. Now, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Collards are two other notable um, individuals of the Romantic era, and they were deeply influenced by the philosophy of Rousseau and the spirit of the early French Revolution. And you can see when they wrote, it was a little bit earlier. In 1798, both poets published Lyrical Ballad, which was 
one of the most influential literary works in the history of the English language. Now, um, they defied the classic rules. They abounded uh, the flowery poetic conventions of an ordinary language, and they believed that nature was a mysterious force from which the poet could learn. They portrayed simple subjects in a highly idealized and majestic ways. And again, you can see and look up uh, examples of this, and there are some examples of various um, of these composers, of these various artists and um, writers uh, in your textbooks. Next one, Lord Byron in England um, embodied the melancholic romantic figure. Um, and, you know, one of the things, not only did he write about this stuff, he was this stuff. Um, and what am I talking about? Uh, in 1824, he went romantically to help fight for the Greeks in their quest for independence against the Turks and while while they're fighting he was killed in 1824 um, you know you also have Sir Walter Scott I mentioned him earlier uh, who wrote long narrative poems and historical novels um, you know Rob Roy in 1817 Ivanhoe um, which is a story uh, of a fight between the Saxon and Norman Knights in medieval England and it represents the romantic interest in history and influenced the German romanticism of Goethe. Now, uh, another thing, this was very popular in the pre-Civil War South, as many, many Southerners with life on their plantations kind of viewed themselves as ancient, um, if you will, or not ancient, I guess it's to say, uh, middle-aged nobility, aristocracy, taking care of things and um, so a lot of these stories were very popular in the antebellum uh, Civil War United States of America. Now, Percy Bysshe Shelley uh, wrote Prometheus Unbound, which is a detailed the revolt of humans against a society that oppresses them, you know, kind of Luddite-ish, uh, if you read chapter 20. And one of the things that he did was one of his wives, uh, Mary Shelley, authored Frankenstein, which again, if you read the textbook, they do a good job of kind of explaining how Frankenstein is kind of ripping on the reason and um, the possibilities of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment of solving all problems that that man can control nature but in the end if you remember um, in the story of Frankenstein man cannot control nature and attempts to do so could be disastrous okay so one of the things that we're going to do tomorrow uh, to start off to see if you did this lesson, I'm going to look to see if you took notes and all those other good things. We'll ask, uh, have the opportunity for you guys to ask questions. And so um, the other thing that we're going to do is a quick write. So I don't know which one I'm going to do yet, but let's just say this is like a short answer question drill uh, using this painting by Horace uh, Vernet, which is titled The Revolution of 1830 and Your Knowledge of European History. Uh, this is actually uh, one of the things, uh, one of the short answer drills in your textbook. Briefly explain one way in which this painting shows a characteristic of romantic art. So what do you see here that's romantic? Uh, explain a second way in which this painting shows a characteristic of romantic art. So go back to your characteristics. What do you see here uh, that demonstrates characteristics of romantic art? And then briefly explain a characteristic of romantic art that actually isn't emphasized uh, in this painting. So you could either uh, use your knowledge here, you could actually look some stuff up online uh, if, you chair, if, if you choose to. Um, and then the other thing is, like I said, this is a very, very popular topic, okay? So here are examples of prompts previously on the AP exam uh, that have been basically uh, in some way, shape, or form uh, involved the romantic movement. So the first one, compare, and contra uh, compare the characteristics of the art movements during the 15th and 16th centuries. If you remember, I talked a little bit about mannerism uh, with the characteristics of the art movements in the second half of the 19th century. The other thing, if you remember, uh, if we're talking about Baroque, a lot of the uh, stories, or I guess I should say topics of the Baroque were actually religious heroes. So there's, a, there's another uh, significant comparison. Uh, another one would be to compare and contrast the ideas of the Romantic era with those in the Enlightenment. You know, we talked about neoclassical. We talked about the perception of the Middle Ages. So there's some stuff there. And here's a typo. Whoa. Two live footage there. Edit. To what extent did, the Rom did Romanticism play a political and philosophical role in Europe between 1800 and 1850? And obviously, we want to associate those with the liberal and nationalistic desires of the revolts of 1830. Uh, in 1848, but also you could mention uh, the Greeks, 
You can mention uh, what happened in Spain with uh, Ferdinand the Seventh. So those are just some things that you might want to do. And again, I really do apologize um, for doing this to you. I really do. Uh, however, please understand uh, that it is my duty to try to help you guys that are going to take this test. Uh, do the best that you can and make sure that we cover the material that we need to. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, enjoy your day off and don't take too long with this assignment. I'll see you tomorrow.